Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert, I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm your host, Wayne Zool, and this is the Astro Guy Podcast. In this episode, the second installment of the Great Astronomers series, we'll be delving into the life, discoveries, and contributions of the Renaissance man, Sir William Herschel. So sit back and enjoy. William Herschel, as he's remembered, was born Frederick Wilhelm Herschel on November 15th, 1738, in the electorate of Hanover, Germany, although at the time, Hanover was part of the Holy Roman Empire. He was one of ten children. His father, Isaac, was an oboist with the Hanover military band, and both Wilhelm and his brother Jacob would later serve with their father as oboists in the Hanoverian Guards. During this time in his life, The Hanoverian Guards were ordered to go to England, as the royal families of Great Britain and Hanover were united by King George II. They were later recalled back to Hanover while England was at war with France. After the Hanoverian Guard was defeated in Hastenbeck in 1757, their father sent Wilhelm and Jacob to England to seek refuge. Wilhelm was accused of desertion for which he was eventually pardoned by King George. At the young age of 19, he was living in England and quickly learning English, which is when he changed his name from Wilhelm to William. He was a talented musician, and besides playing the oboe, he played the violin and the harpsichord. A bit later, he would learn to play the organ as well. William Herschel began making his living as a musician, and during this time he composed 24 symphonies as well as several other concertos and even some church music. Several of his symphonies have been recorded in recent years and are available online. While Herschel was a minor musical success at the time, he was considered a contemporary of Mozart. In 1766, William became the organist for the Octagon Chapel in Bath, England. In 1772, his sister Caroline, who would play a major role in his astronomical life, moved to Bath to live with William. She also performed singing soprano with the orchestra in Bath. Bath would be his home for several years, although later he would move to Slough. Now, if you're a fan of The Office, Slough was the town where the British version took place. It was also the street name in the American version for the fictional company Dunder Mifflin. Slough would be the home for Herschel for most of his adult life. However, while in Bath, Herschel lived on New King Street. The house where he lived is now the home of the Herschel Museum of Astronomy. In Bath, William began reading a lot about natural philosophy, which eventually led to his interest in astronomy. He read several of Robert Smith's books, but in Smith's complete system of optics, Herschel read about how to build a telescope. He began to read more about the subject and eventually took lessons from a local mirror maker so that he could build his own reflecting telescope. He was nearly obsessed with making mirrors. Many days, he would spend up to 16 hours grinding and polishing the speculum metal mirrors that were used in telescopes at that time. Fortunately, Caroline would help him, and their brother, Alexander, was a skilled craftsman who would help him complete several of his telescopes. Herschel began making astronomical observations at night, starting in May of 1773. In early 1774, he began keeping a journal of his observations where he would note things that he had seen, such as Saturn and the Great Nebula in Orion, which was not yet known as M42. 
As Herschel began his observational work, he became interested in double stars, particularly in trying to measure their changing separation over time as a method of measuring proper motion and parallax shifts. This was based on a method first proposed by Galileo. Herschel would observe with a 6-inch F13 Newtonian telescope. Herschel described the telescope as, and I quote, as having a most capital speculum of his own making. In the fall of 1779, Herschel began doing his first systematic search. Over time, he discovered far more binary and multiple star systems than anyone had expected. He was meticulous with measuring the positions of these stars and compiled them into two catalogues for the Royal Society of London in 1782 as well as 1784. A third catalog of discoveries made after 1783 was published in 1821. The three catalogs contained observations and data on more than 800 different double and multiple star systems. In 1797, he revisited some of his older observations and noticed many changes in the relative positions of many systems that were not attributed to parallax. At this time, he hypothesized that these were actually binary sidereal systems orbiting under mutual gravitational attraction. This was groundbreaking for the time, and his theoretical and observational works became the foundation for modern binary star research. If the only thing that Herschel did was his work on binary stars, he'd probably make the list of great astronomers, but he did a lot more. Herschel's greatest discovery came during an intermission in a musical performance in March of 1781. During the break, he went to his telescope to search for binary stars and found an object that appeared as a small disk. Initially, Herschel thought that it may have been a comet, but after several observations of it, and with the help of William Lexell, an orbit was computed. It was then that they realized that this was a distant planet orbiting the sun beyond the orbit of Saturn. Herschel called the new planet Georgium Sidus, in honor of King George, which led to the aforementioned pardon for desertion. In most of the world, they began referring to the new planet as Herschel. However, the name didn't stick, and Uranus was eventually adopted and universally accepted as the name of the seventh planet in our solar system. After the discovery of Uranus, Herschel was given a stipend by the king and appointed the king's astronomer. Now he was able to devote himself full-time to his astronomical and optical endeavors. Starting in 1782, Herschel started a systematic survey to locate and catalog non-stellar objects, what we refer to today as DSOs, or deep sky objects, which are star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies although galaxies were referred to as nebulae at the time. Over the next 20 years, Herschel used several different telescopes for his observations. He built several 20-foot reflectors, meaning that they were 20 feet long, as well as a 40-foot giant, the largest telescope in the world for many years. He would typically be on a ladder looking through the eyepiece and would call out his observations to his sister Caroline, who would record them. They worked very well together, and Caroline would later become famous in her own right for discovering more comets than any other person, a record that would stand for nearly 200 years. Later in his life, he would also work with his son John, who would continue his father's cataloging in the Southern Hemisphere. John also became an early pioneer in the field of photography. So, William went on to discover more than 2,400 nebulae, again, a term for any diffuse object at that time. He began to publish these discoveries in a series of catalogs 
that later became incorporated as part of the NGC catalog, or New General Catalog, that was first published in 1888 by John Lewis Amel Dreyer, and contained 7,840 deep sky objects. The NGC catalog is still considered the standard and is still in use today. Herschel had some interesting ideas about life beyond Earth. He believed that he'd found evidence of life on the moon, which he didn't. He went so far as to compare the lunar surface as being similar to the English countryside. He also believed that there was life on Mars, and he speculated that the interior of the sun was populated with life. His curiosity led him to discover a correlation between the sun and climate on Earth. He would regularly observe sunspots and went so far as to compare changes in solar activity to wheat prices. However, this was during a prolonged period of reduced solar activity, so that correlation was a coincidence. William Herschel would discover many other things. Besides Uranus, he discovered its moons Titania and Oberon. He also discovered two of Saturn's moons, Mimas and Enceladus. He measured the axial tilt of Mars and discovered that Mars's ice caps changed size based on the Martian seasons. He studied the proper motions of stars and demonstrated that the sun was moving through space, even determining its direction to within 10 degrees of what we now know it to be. Herschel spent time studying the structure of the Milky Way and even concluded that it was a disk shape, although he wrongly assumed that the sun was at the center of the disk. Early in the year 1800, Herschel was testing different filters to observe sunlight through, and he noticed that the different colors of light seemed to generate different amounts of heat. He measured the light passing through a prism with a thermometer, and he discovered a higher temperature beyond the red part of the spectrum. This led to his discovery of infrared radiation. He even used a microscope to determine that coral was not a plant because it lacked cell walls. William Herschel died on August 25, 1822, after suffering from a long illness. He is buried at St. Lawrence's Church in Upton, Slough. His epitaph reads, Calorum Parupi Claustra, which translates to, He broke through the barriers of the heavens. Besides the museum in Slough, William Herschel has a crater named for him on the moon. There is a Herschel impact basin on Mars. A crater on Saturn's moon Mimas is named Herschel, and one of the gaps in Saturn's rings is called the Herschel Gap. He is also honored by the asteroid 2000 Herschel, and in 2009, the ESA launched the Herschel Space Telescope. There are many buildings, streets, schools, and more named in his honor for all the work that he did in the field of astronomy. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy podcast group on Facebook. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, The Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please subscribe. Please consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform, as this can help us get new listeners. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.
I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe noctum. Seize the night.